Dear guests, for the next hour, we will be having the first roundtable discussion entitled Towards a New World Order. For the keynote speech, I would like to invite the former president of Germany, Christian Wolff. Now I would like to invite the panelists and the moderator to take their seats. Um, our moderator for the session is Professor Dr. Iltar Turan, Vice President of Honorary Board of ICP. And the panelists, Dr. Maha Hossein Aziz, author USA. Dr. Juan Juan Antonio March, President, Ono Art Spain. Professor Gülnur Aybet, Senior Advisor to the President of the Republic of Turkey. I'd like to repeat our moderator and the panelists. Our moderator for the session is Professor Iltar Turan, Vice President of Honorary Board of ICP, and the panelists are Dr. Maha Hossein Aziz, author USA, Juan Antonio March, President Honor Art Spain, Professor Gülnur Aybet, Senior Advisor to the President of Republic of Turkey. Günaydın. Sabahtan itibaren bu panelin konusu üzerinde muhtelif konuşmacılar zaten değerlendirmeler yaptılar. Biz de bu değerlendirmelere bu oturum aracılığıyla devam edeceğiz. Sizlerin de müşahede ettiği gibi şöyle bir açmazla karşı karşıyayız. Bir yandan dünyanın karşılaştığı muhtelif sorunlar karşısında uluslararası işbirliğine duyulan ihtiyaç artarken diğer yandan da bu uluslararası işbirliği ihtiyacına yol açan gelişmeler aynı zamanda ülkelerin uluslararası işbirliğine karşı direnmeleriyle de sonuçlanmaktadır. Belki bunun altında dünyanın ikinci dünya savaşı sonrasındaki düzeninin artık mevcut yapıyı taşıyamayacak bir duruma gelmiş olması yatmaktadır. Bununla birlikte ümitsizliğe kapatmamak lazım. Yine konuşmalar sırasında da dile getirildiği gibi genellikle büyük değişimler öncesi dünya sıkıntılı dönemler yaşamakta. Fakat bu sıkıntılı dönemlerde sonunda aşılabilmektedir. Sabahtan itibaren ifade edilen görüşleri burada daha da işlemek ve geliştirmek arzusundayız ve sizlerin de programda gördüğünüz gibi son derece yetkin şahsiyetlerden oluşan bir de panelimiz var. Bir noktadan sonra herhalde belki Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı Christian Hof'u da dinleme imkanımız olacaktır. Fakat şu anda ben e, programdaki sırayı da izleyerek e, oturumu başlatacağım. Sayın konuşmacılara ricam yalnız e, biraz da e, geç başladığımız için e, süre kısıtlamalarına e, mümkün olduğu kadar e, ya, ita itaat etmeleridir. E, Doktor Maha Hüseyin Aziz New York Üniversitesi hocalarından yeni bir dünya düzenine doğru gayretlerimizi önce kendisinin vereceği fikirlerden yola çıkarak şekillendirmeye çalışalım. Bir 10-12 dakika içerisinde düşüncelerinizi özetleyebilirseniz tabii ki çok memnun olacağız Aziz. You're able to follow it, right? Yeah. About 20. 12 minutes. Sure. Very good. Thanks. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for having me. 
I've only been to Istanbul as a tourist, so this is a, it's very nice to be here in this capacity. Um, as was mentioned by the chair, I'm a professor at NYU. I focus on global risk. Uh, basically, that means the threats to our stability, what could go wrong. It's a topic I've taught and researched and consulted on with governments for many years. And um, uh, I'm also a visiting fellow at the LSC, Institute of Global Affairs, and most recently, the last few months, I've been promoting uh, my first book, Future World Order, which is a topic that's very relevant to this panel. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, what I have described in my book as a global legitimacy crisis. There are certain trends that are building in every region of the world. And um, uh, it's, uh, we can't put all the blame on one presidential election, for instance in the US, or on a vote in terms of Brexit. Uh, there has been a challenge to the status quo in four key areas. And in my book, I consider how we are faced with a a global legitimacy crisis. We are truly at a sensitive turning point. Firstly, we are at a crossroads geopolitically. As everyone knows, given President Trump's rhetoric, this is not a US-led world order in the way that it was in the early years of the post-Cold War era. And uh, we've, uh, the debate is on. Uh, the assumption is to uh, to assume that it's going to be a US versus China dynamic that's leading the world in the coming years, uh, or at least in 2020, but I think that would be limiting ourselves. Others argue that the future is Asian. Uh, uh, for instance, Parag Khanna, who wrote a book on this topic. Um, others consider that the future could be African because of sheer population size, and so forth. I consider in my book that maybe this is the era of a post-hegemonic system where we're seeing the rise of other types of actors, non-state actors, the, the tech armed citizen that brings down governments, or uh, the activist billionaire that's trying to shape US politics. Uh, this is certainly not a US-led world order, but what is it? It's unlikely we'll have a consensus on this in 2020. That inherently is a risk, a threat to our stability. Secondly, we're at a crossroads politically. I'm sure you're aware in the last 10 years, there have been citizen-led movements against both democracies and non-democracies in every part of the world. Citizens armed with tech challenging political elites and demanding something different. Uh, the debate in academic circles and even policy circles is that perhaps we are, perhaps democracy is not the best system. Are we headed towards another phase of our political development? despite what we assumed at the, at the end of the post-Cold War that democracy was the last surviving source of political legitimacy. Thirdly, we are also at a crossroads economically. Everyone is aware that globaliza globalization has led to a lot of inequality uh, in recent years and led to many uh, citizen-led movements since 1999. But now we see a state-led alternative in terms of economic nationalism and populism. And we see that there is a looming cloud of automation that could lead to a lot of unrest where many of us may lose our jobs to robots and it's not clear that our governments are necessarily prepared. Can globalization withstand both populism and the threat of automation? And lastly, the, the last part of the, our current global legitimacy crisis that will persist into 2020 is is social, it's our identity crisis or a crisis of global values. Again, this is not a US-led world order where an international community is promoting democracy, human rights, and values of inclusivity. Rather, we are faced with a question, are we globalists or are we nationalists? It seems as th at this point that we are being forced to pick sides um, and, and really reflect on whether we have global values anymore. Do we need them? Uh, related to that, I think everyone is aware that we've seen the evolution of extremism in the last 10 years, from Islamist extremism to far-right, to Hindu extremism, to Buddhist extremism. 
uh, non-state actors that are promoting this ideology of hate. The problem is that this xenophobic sentiment is also within our societies um, and even coming from the level of the state where lead certain leaders in the world are perhaps expressing very negative rhetoric about the other, about the refugee, about the migrant. And again, I ask you, are you a globalist or are you a nationalist? This is what we'll need to uh, contend with in the next few years. So that is the global legitimacy crisis, which appears to have been exacerbated by tech in some ways. If it's not a US-led world, world order, what is it? Can globalization withstand populism and automation? Uh, is democracy still the best system? And lastly, are we globalists or are we nationalists? These are the four areas, the four challenges that we'll have to tackle in the coming years. It won't, there won't be clarity, and that inherently is, is the global legitimacy crisis, which I talk about in my book, and I'm happy to take questions later. Um, thank you. Well, thank you very much. I think the questions are challenging. The answers will take a long time to mm -hmm. develop, it seems. It's not easy. And it's more complicated even than it appears because mm -hmm. uh, when you become a globalist, I mean, like you suggested, <laughs> and that created e inequalities. Mm -hmm. But then the response to it uh, in terms of protectionism, et cetera, is a response to protect the privileged system that has developed rather than a system to reform or modify it. Exactly. So uh, the challenge is indeed very, very deep. Uh, and, and now we're fortunate that uh, President Christian Wolf uh, of Germany has arrived and uh, it's a pleasure to invite him to the podium maybe uh, since he has to maybe talk a little longer than the rest of us. So please, uh, with this president. Sehr geehrter Herr Professor Turan, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, entschuldigen Sie meine Verspätung. Ich war etwas falsch informiert. Istanbul ist ein perfekter Ort, über die neue Weltordnung zu sprechen. Napoleon soll gesagt haben, wenn die Welt ein Staat wäre, dann wäre Istanbul dessen Hauptstadt. Also ist das ein guter Ort, von hier aus die Welt zu betrachten. Die neue Weltordnung wird meines Erachtens eine ganz große Weltunordnung, die durchaus besorgniserregend ist. Der Wind des Wandels wurde mir vor einigen Tagen in Moskau überdeutlich, als ich mit dem Friedensnobelpreisträger Lech Walesa aus Polen bei Michael Gorbatschow war, um ihm für die Einheit Europas zu danken die Gorbatschow möglich gemacht hat, indem er damals den Völkern der Sowjetunion, den Völkern des Warschauer Pakts und dem deutschen Volk die Möglichkeit gegeben hat, die Mauer, das Brandenburger Tor zu öffnen und den eisernen Vorhang durch Europa zu öffnen. Wir sind bis heute den Türken dankbar, dass sie mit der NATO an der Grenze zum Warschauer Pakt die Freiheit Europas über Jahrzehnte erhalten haben. Wir dachten 1989, jetzt setzen sich weltweit westliche Demokratien durch. Es ist eine Frage der Zeit und wir haben uns darin getäuscht. Es hat sich anders entwickelt. Damals texteten die Scorpions, Wind of Change, Wandel zu Selbstbestimmung und Freiheit. Heute gibt es einen Wind of Change in Richtung, wir haben es eben gehört, Nationalismus, Protektionismus, Abgrenzung. In der ganzen Welt finden Autokraten immer mehr Sympathie. Die Gründe können im Terror, 11. September, in der Finanzkrise 
aber auch im Internet zu suchen sein. Erst hatten wir große Hoffnungen mit dem arabischen Frühling und dann haben wir festgestellt, dass dort das Internet zur Überwachung und Desinformation genutzt wird. Auch in der Erwartung an den arabischen Frühling haben wir uns getäuscht. Ich mache mir deshalb Sorgen, weil die Menschen immer nur zu guten Ergebnissen gekommen sind, nachdem sie in den Abgrund geschaut haben. Nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg hat der amerikanische Präsident Wilson ein 14-Punkte-Programm präsentiert für den Freihandel, für multilaterale Zusammenarbeit, weg von Hinterzimmerdiplomatie. Dann waren die Amerikaner beim Völkerbund schon nicht mehr dabei und dann kamen die Nazis in Europa und haben diese Entwicklung zur Zusammenarbeit zerstört. Besonders positiv ist mir in Erinnerung Atatürk. Frieden nach innen, Frieden in der Welt. Aber das wurde nicht gehört. Und das zweite Mal waren die Menschen klug nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. Mit den Vereinten Nationen, mit der allgemeinen Erklärung der Menschenrechte, mit der Gründung der Europäischen Union Nachdem man in den Abgrund geschaut hatte des Zweiten Weltkrieges, wurde man klug und man wurde so klug, dass wir ein Weltklimaabkommen in Paris geschlossen haben, dass wir Abrüstungsverträge geschlossen haben, dass wir Millenniumsziele in den Vereinten Nationen vereinbart haben. Und heute haben wir den Wind of Change, Bruch von internationalen Vereinbarungen, Großbritannien raus aus der Europäischen Union, America first, keine internationalen Gremien zu stärken und das macht mir Sorge. Die Menschen nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg sagten, nie wieder Krieg, nie wieder gegen die Menschenwürde, nie wieder Nationalismus, weil er am Ende in den Krieg führt. Und heute hören wir weltweit wieder Stimmen, die Nation wichtiger zu nehmen als internationale Zusammenarbeit. Und das in einer Zeit, wo die großen Probleme zusammen lösbar sind oder gar nicht mehr lösbar sind. Klimaschutz, Terrorbekämpfung, Migrationsbewältigung, Weltfinanzsystem, das geht zusammen oder es geht gar nicht. Im Moment ist die Stimmung in vielen Demokratien schlecht, aber die wirtschaftliche Lage gut. Was soll werden, wenn die wirtschaftliche Lage schlechter wird? Wie wird dann die Stimmung werden, wenn sich die Wirtschaft eintrübt? Und wenn das Finanzsystem weltweit in die Krise kommt, hat dann diese Welt die Kraft, wie 2007, 2008 zusammenzustehen, und den Umsturz, den Einsturz der Weltwirtschaft zu verhindern? Weitere Bemerkung, geostrategisch. Wir haben es eben gehört, ich kann vielem beipflichten. Das Weltbruttosozialprodukt wird von Nord nach Süd und ganz stark von West nach Ost verlagert. Früher war der Mittelpunkt zwischen Amerika und Europa. Dieser Mittelpunkt liegt heute zwischen Türkei und arabischer Welt und er wird weiter Richtung China verlaufen. Das zeigt auch BRICS und deren Bedeutungszuwachs, Brasilien, Russland, Indien, China, Südafrika. China wird die Nummer eins der Welt und die Auseinandersetzung Amerika-China wird die Welt beschäftigen. Und es wird interessant sein zu hören, wie im Panel dieses Konfliktfeld zwischen Amerika und China beurteilt wird. Ich glaube, wir müssen die Seidenstraßeninitiative der Chinesen sehr ernst nehmen. Darin stecken ja auch Chancen für Afrika, darin stecken auch Chancen für die arabische Halbinsel, für den indischen Subkontinent. Es könnte sein, dass Regionen befriedet werden, dass Länder wie Pakistan profitieren werden. Es kann sein, dass das Weltwirtschaftswachstum zunehmen wird durch die Seidenstraße. Und es kann neue Entwicklungsachsen geben, wo Europäer und Chinesen mit afrikanischen Freunden auf gleicher Augenhöhe die Entwicklung dieses Kontinents voranbringen. Aber die Risiken sind groß, die Systemunterschiede sind groß, die Abhängigkeiten dürfen nicht stärker werden. 
Wir müssen aber Asien in den Blick nehmen. Ende März war ich bei der Seidenstraßenkonferenz auf Einladung des chinesischen Staatspräsidenten Xi Jinping. Und dort sprachen Pakistan, Chile, Russland, Kasachstan und viele andere Staatsführer. Und ich habe dann nach Stunden gefragt, wer ist denn der erste Europäer, der sprechen wird? Und da sagten mir die chinesischen Freunde, Europa hat bereits gesprochen, denn für Europa hat ja Putin gesprochen. Das war das Bild dort in Beijing über die Rolle Europas, dass man sich zufrieden gab, dass Putin der Sprecher Europas gewesen sei. Das hat mich beunruhigt. Und ich sehe Ultranationalisten in Indien, ich sehe in Afrika und der arabischen Welt eine Reihe von Staaten, die sich als Ordnungsmächte ansehen, Nigeria, Südafrika, Ägypten, Saudi-Arabien, Iran, aber keines der Länder hat die Grenzen regional destruktiven Denkens und Handelns überwinden können. Russland greift ein, um eigene Interessen zu sichern. Gleichzeitig spüren wir den Rückzug Amerikas aus der Welt, aus Europa, aus der Verantwortung in der arabischen Welt mit Verlust seiner dominierenden Rolle und darunter leiden vor allem wir Deutschen. Die Deutschen haben profitiert, dass die Amerikaner uns von den Nazis befreit haben, dass sie uns geholfen haben zur wirtschaftlichen Entwicklung mit dem Marshallplan, dass sie uns geholfen haben zur Demokratie, John F. Kennedy hat gesprochen, ich bin ein Berliner. Reagan hat gesagt, Mr. Gorbatschow, öffnen Sie dieses Brandenburger Tor. Und so haben wir ein sehr positives Bild Amerikas und sehr viel Dankbarkeit gegenüber Amerika. Aber heute ist nicht zu erwarten, dass der amerikanische Präsident sich in dieser Weise um Deutschland, um Europa, um die westlichen Demokratien kümmern würde. Mich interessiert für das Panel welche Rolle die Türkei anstrebt. Die Türkei kann eine Brücke sein zwischen Asien, Europa und Afrika. Der neue Flughafen ist dafür ein Sinnbild. Das ist eine erfolgreiche Politik zwischen Asien, Europa und Afrika Richtung Amerika, eine solche Plattform, ein solches Drehkreuz zu errichten, was die günstige geostrategische Lage der Türkei unterstreicht. Die Türkei kann Mittler sein zwischen Abendland und Morgenland. Oder will sie neutral sein? Mal Europa, mal Russland, mal China, mal arabische Welt, islamische Welt. Die Frage, welche Rolle sieht die Türkei in diesem unordentlichen weltpolitischen Gefüge einer polypolaren Welt, die viel mehr Unsicherheiten hat als früher mit zwei Blöcken, wo sich die ganze Welt ausrichtete auf Washington oder auf Moskau. Jetzt ist die Welt unübersichtlich und die neue Welt wird von dieser Unübersichtlichkeit geprägt sein. Ich halte auch fast 100 Jahre später den Satz von Atatürk, Frieden nach innen, Frieden in der Welt für einen der wichtigsten Leitsätze für eine Weltordnung der Zukunft. Wenn man in seinem Land nicht spaltet, Republikaner gegen Demokraten, Sunniten gegen Schiiten, Christen gegen Muslime, sondern wenn man in seinem Land die Einheit erhält, den Zusammenhalt erhält, dann kann man auch eine friedliche Rolle in der Welt spielen und zur internationalen Zusammenarbeit kommen. In meinem Land, der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, sage ich gerade jungen Menschen, meine Eltern mussten den Wiederaufbau leisten nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. Meine Generation musste die Einheit Deutschlands und die Einheit Europas leisten. Die jetzigen Verantwortungsträger, die Politiker der Zukunft, müssen den Zusammenhalt im Land bewältigen, von verschiedenen Menschen verschiedener Herkunft, verschiedener Religion, verschiedenen Aussehens und müssen darüber hinaus den Zusammenhalt dieser Welt ermöglichen. Und das ist schwerer geworden. Das ist schwerer geworden angesichts der Unsicherheiten, angesichts der weltweiten Vernetzung. Und im Grunde ist eben schon vieles Kluges gesagt worden. Darüber werden wir jetzt diskutieren. Was kann man als einen positiven Beitrag tun, um in dieser Welt wieder Stabilität zu steigern, Frieden zu ermöglichen und einen großen Konflikt, große Kriege zu verhindern. Die Gefahr von Kriegen, von Terror und Konflikten ist gewachsen und nicht geringer geworden. 
und die große Aufgabe, die die Kleinen stellen, das ist das Zusammenstehen für den Schutz des Weltklimas. Das soll meine letzte Bemerkung sein. Wir, die wir hier im Saal versammelt sind, wir leben im Holozän. Das ist das einzige geologische Zeitalter, in dem menschliches Leben möglich war. Wir sind übergegangen in das Anthropozän, die erste Zeit, die vom Menschen maßgeblich verändert wurde. Und junge Leute leben im Jahr 2100 und die fragen, wie wird die Welt im Jahr 2100 sein. Wir überlegen 2030, aber die, meine Kinder, mein elfjähriger Sohn fragt, wie wird es 2100 sein, denn dann wird er leben können. Kann er dann leben? Und wenn wir darauf keine Antworten finden, dann sehe ich diese Welt in der Gefahr, sich selbst zu überwinden und menschliches Leben unmöglich zu machen. Ich glaube, das sind die großen Herausforderungen der neuen Weltordnung. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Thank you. Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı'na çok çok teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, özellikle hani, uzun süredir e, belki hatırlamakta e, ihmalkar davrandığımız yurtta suh, cihanda suh e, ifadesini bize hatırlattı. Çünkü e, aslında bir ülkenin içinde barış olmadığı zaman o durum o ülkenin uluslararası ilişkilerini de olumsuz yönde etkilemekte. Buna karşılık uluslararası alandaki geçimsizlikler de ülkelerin iç politikalarındaki dengeleri bozmaktadır. Dolayısıyla bu dünya düzenini inşa etmeye çalıştığımız zaman sadece dünyanın uluslararası çaptaki düzenini değil, aynı zamanda ülkelerin de barış içerisinde yaşamasını sağlayacak tedbirlerin bir arada düşünülmesinin ne kadar önemli olduğu bu veciz ifadeyle o zamandan beri gayet açık bir şekilde ortaya konmuştur. Çok teşekkür ederiz Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı. Biz şimdi yine oturumumuza bu önemli konuyu efendim eski bir kelime kullanmama müsaade edin. Tezekkür ederek devam edeceğiz efendim. Ve şimdi de Juan Antonio Marchi davet ediyorum. Onu artın başkanı İspanya'da. Uh, please let me take the floor about 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's correct. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much ICP to inviting me here and especially to put this subject of the new world order as uh, the first big issue of this conference because I think that the political architecture should be the first, the main point in the agenda of the people in our era. Um, we have many issues that are already very well accepted by the, by the public opinion, uh, by the political leaders, as uh, very global important issues like environment, or the fight against terrorism, or the trade regulations, but the key the really key issue is which political architecture we have. Uh, we have an example that explains it very clearly and is the case of China. China was, had only $300 per capita income in 1951. In 1981 had only $380 per capita income. It's to say during 30 years, they only got 80 extra dollars in the purchasing power of the people. When Deng Xiaoping decides to change the course of the country, decides to change the regulations that will affect the social and the economic interaction between the, the citizens, the country goes from $380 in 1981 to 9,000 in 2018. So the country who was unable to get more than $80 in 30 years was able to gain $8,400 in 36 years. So the key, thing, the key thing is how you organize the game. What is the political architecture at national and obviously at global level? 
He was the, the great uh, scholar, the son of uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, James Galbraith, who say the key thing to development is not education, is not the financing. The key, the key issue for development is how you organize the game. How you organize the game determines the result of the game. So going to the world as, as, as the key issue of this conference, I would say that obviously we are in a transit period. We are in the post-Western order, and we go towards a new order. And the political architecture of this order will be essential. Either we move um, to a new order on the balance of power, is to say we continue with the same thing that we have done for centuries, uh, which are the main leaders and who organize the other countries uh, around certain leaders, or we go to a really new period that is a, a kind of global democratic order. That is absolutely the key issue, and from there, we can talk about war and peace, prosperity and decline. That is the key issue that should be number one in the agenda. Obviously, if we go to a new balance of power, obviously we go to a, an order based on two big leaders, would be the United States and China. Uh, obviously, the United States is becoming very, very, very minor power in uh, 60, 70 years because the, the population cannot grow much. Uh, the limits of the border are clear, whereas China is a great civilization, is, is a great space that will be well organized. A figure will, will put it very clearly. If we think of the population who are between 15 and 25 years old, the population that we go to university, we see that the Americans, they have 30 million people. If you take who can be the leaders of these 30 million people, you see that half of the populations, half, half, 15, are not going to the university, are not preparing to be nothing important in the economy at that period of age, 15 to 25. So you have only 50 million, 15 million, half of them, they want to be good professionals but no leaders. So maybe the United States is preparing 7.5 million people between 15 and 25 years that want to be the great doctor, the great, the great um, economies, the great businessmen, etc. The Chinese, between 15 and 25, there are 200 million people. Because of the policy of a single child, policy of the single child, all of them are under a personal coaching of the family, saying, choose whatever you like, but you have to be the best of the best. Because in 20 years' time, the state we will not provide us with any protection, and you will be our protection. So you take away 30%, because maybe they are not very capable intellectually, maybe they are in rural areas, um, still there is not great development in the area where they are living, but you take 30% out, you have 140 million. You have 140 million individuals between 15 and 25 years old that are at this moment under a personal coaching to be the best of the best in the profession they are going to choose. So, United States is preparing 7.5 million, China is preparing 140 million. That is the world that's going to appear in 25 years. And we have not to criticize the Chinese for doing that. They are just doing what they have to do, is to prepare well the population. Obviously, in this new balance of power, there is no role for the United States to play alone. There is no role for the European Union to think uh, that is a sufficient, a strong space. There is no role for Russia thinking that they can do something alone. And there is no way for Turkey to think Turkey can do something alone. I think really this big space that is the United States, Russia, Turkey, and the European Union, we have to have 
a big global space in our area. It's only a space of 1.3 million people. It's 200 million people less than China, and it has sufficient synergies to be all together. That is absolutely essential. The first thing we have to do is, like Mr. The President, former President of the Spanish government, uh, Jose Luis Rodríguez Zapatero was mentioning, we have to have Turkey on board of the European Union. In my personal view, it's totally wrong those in the European Union who think that it's not possible to have Turkey on board, and it's also wrong to those in Turkey who say, well, we have done already a big effort during a long time, this is not working, let's do for another path. No, I think really we have to create this synergy between Russia, the uh, Europe, and Turkey, creating a great space, and make the United States to understand that this is a new big space to be organized in the West. But the key issue is not to go to this kind of balance of power. This is a kind of previous stage to arrive to the real important one, that is to have a global architecture for everybody. And why? Because the thing that we have to understand is that the position of the individuals have changed dramatically in this century, in the 21st century. We are going towards what we could call the very intelligent human beings. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, what we had? A new kind of organizing the production, but the human beings being as a workforce. We had a factory in Manchester with 5,000 people working, and 4,980 were doing a mechanical thing. They are, just, they are just controlling a very elemental machine, making some kind of textile. There were only 20 people out of 5,000 people with a very intellectual or intelligent role. They were planning which kind of product to produce in the future, uh, how to develop new markets, uh, how to reorganize the work inside the factory. So only 20 out of 5,000 were in an intellectual role. If we go to the same site in Manchester today, what we find, we find 200 industries with 25 people and 75% of the people are on intelligent roles. So the key thing is that we're going to a humanity that is going to be extremely intelligent. And the same thing that the, the fingerprint of each individual out of 7.5 billion people is different, the same is the intellectual capacity of these 7.5 billion. So if we have an order that allows each individual to really to produce, to innovate, to propose, we are going to have a very powerful world. And just to conclude, I would say that I have been very marked always by two thoughts. One was the intervention of Simon Perez when I was the Spanish ambassador in Russia. He was a doctor honoris causa in the Lemonosov uh, University in Moscow. And someone asked him, what do you think it will be the 21st century? And he said, well, you know, the 21st century will be the first different century of the humanity. So people were very shocked and asked him why. And he said, well, because up to now, for 200,000 200, years, humanity has used the brain to understand what's happening outside. And they have copied what was happening outside. They have seen the birds flying. They have produced a plane. They have seen the, the horses riding. They have produced the cars and the trains. 21st century is the first century that the humanity is going, is going to discover the brain, his brain. And by discovering the brain, the human beings are going to discover what are the potentials. And this is linked with the sentence, uh, with the phrase of uh, Steve Hawkins, that when he was asked, what do you think is the destiny of humanity? He said, the destiny of the human beings is to be the bees, the pollinizers of knowledge in the universe. So the key thing for us is we are going to go to the outer space. But how we are going to go to the outer space? As a civilization of harmony, 
a civilization has been able to create the political order in planet Earth and to get the maximum of the human beings, or are we going to the outer space as a, as a, a species of conflict, of fight, that try to discover a new place to start again the history, as we start the history in other continents at the beginning of modernity. So that is a key thing, and that's why I think that to put the political architecture as the main issue is key for our future. Thank you very much. Sayın Büyükelçi, çok teşekkür ediyoruz. Efendim, şimdi 21. yüzyılın insanın kendi beynini başka tabiat olaylarını taklit etmeden kullanmasının başlangıcı olan bir dönem olduğuna işaret ettiler. Daha doğrusu naklen Şimon Perez'den. Tabii bu arada da dünyanın yönetişim sistemi herhalde bu değişiklikle baş etmek için çok daha yoğun bir şekilde ele alınmak gerekiyor. Fakat e, şu andaki tıkanıklığa baktığınız zaman İkinci Dünya Savaşı'ndan sonra oluşmuş olan bir e, yapı bir türlü değişemiyor. Değişmesini engelleyen de faktörler var. Bunlardan bir tanesi değişimi e, gerçekleştirecek kurumsal yapılar içerisinde veto gücü icra edebilen unsurlar var. İkincisi değişimden kazançlı çıkanlar bile bir miktar sistemin parçası oldukları için değişimi, değişim arzuları bir miktar köreltilmiş oluyor. Çin'e bunu bir örnek olarak verebiliriz. Onun için işimiz zor ama öyle bir sistem kurmalıyız ki İkinci Dünya Savaşı sonrası kurulan sistemden farklı olarak küresel değişme karşısında bu sistemde kendini ayarlayıp değişebilsin yoksa değişimliğin başında en büyük engel olarak karşımıza çıkmasın. Evet, son konuşmacımız Profesör Gülnur Aybet, Cumhurbaşkanlığı Baş Danışmanı. Buyurun efendim. Teşekkür ederim. Konuşmamı İngilizce hazırladığımdan dolayı İngilizce devam edeceğim. Uh, we listened to this morning uh, a lot of uh, remarks regarding the world order and the changes that are taking place in it right now. But there are actually three stories here. The first story is the post-1945 story. The second is the post-Cold War story. And the third is the current story of disorder. And they're all linked to each other because it's what we laid down in terms of foundations beforehand that actually led to what uh, we are facing today. So the first story, I think, is one that, you know, ideologically, if we look at it, shaped by uh, men like Kennan, Acheson, and Rostow about a new world order after the Second World War. The post-Cold War story in the 90s uh, was really about perpetuating a liberal world order based on the ideas of those men. Uh, but this time it had a new twist with Fukuyama's end of history and Eikenberry's after victory. Now the difference between the two stories was that I think the first set, the Kennans, Rostos and Atchisons of this world, really believed in the values they were talking about. The second set in the 90s sought to dominate through institutions and sporadic interventions, military ones. The first set, uh, the Atchisons and the Kennans of the world, really believed in the survival of a way of life against another way of life, the Soviet Union. So they were two dominant ideologies. The second set in the 90s uh, set about absorbing the post-communist space. Both have common points. Both really felt that this was all for the greater good, and both had a notion of oughtness. This is how the world ought to be. This is how countries ought to behave. This is how an order should be preserved. Um, and even in Kennan's early writing, when he's critical of the Soviet Union, we see that he says, this is how the Soviet Union ought to behave as a government among governments. And I think it's that word, government among governments, which gives us a clue about this rightful ownership of a certain order. 
So where does this leave us 25 years on from the second story? And what went wrong? I think that's a very important question. Where we are now is, if you want to sort of frame it in the most simplistic way, it's an ideological struggle between those who would want to perpetuate a liberal world order, a rules-based order on institutions, and those who prefer to have an inward-looking, protectionist, anti-globalization viewpoint of the world. And in the second group, in the second set of ideologies, we see the uh, emergence of the far right and anti-immigration. But this ideological struggle that is really dominating the state of affairs today, we have to remember is essentially a Western ideological struggle. So where does that leave the rest of the world? Uh, where that leaves us is basically struggling to survive from the after effects of the 90s and this current predominantly Western ideological struggle between those who want to preserve the liberal order and those who don't. Because this state of affairs has left us with inconsistent policies, lack of leadership, and erroneous interventions in various regions of the world, the Middle East, of course, being one of them, the most significant. And this state of affairs is largely shaped by um, an American policy called offshore balancing, except it's gone wrong. Now, since 1945, the United States has sought to preserve its hegemony in the world order, either through military power projection or offshore balancing. Offshore balancing basically means you know, supporting competition among rival states and proxies to prevent one actor dominating in any given region. Now, the current state of affairs of offshore balancing gone wrong has happened because it's now based really, well, intentionally or unintentionally, on regional instability. So you have a series, a chain reaction of destabilizing policies in regions and a very erroneous choice of proxies, such as arming the YPG, which is a terrorist group. Arming the YPG was just as dangerous and destabilizing as not arming the Bosnian Muslims during the Bosnian War. Both had disastrous consequences in perpetuating conflict. So among these series of destabilizing interventions, non-interventions, and erroneous policies, we also have a set of other questions that lead us to the current mess that we're in. First of all, there's the question of global governance. What are we going to do with the UN? Well, the Gulf War in 1991 was really an exception in uh, the practice of collective security, where you had uh, the Soviet Union, which had just collapsed, turned into Russia, coming together with the Western countries and regional countries, upholding international law, and having the political will and military might to do something about it. NATO's role in the Balkans in the 90s was an exception. And then these exceptions started to wane. We got a situation in Afghanistan with no way out. Libya was another turning point where in the aftermath, both Russia and China said they would never support another UN Security Council resolution, no matter for what humanitarian cause, if it was gonna to lead to regime change. And hence we have the current deadlock in the Security Council. So that's the global governance problem. The second problem is this heads buried in the sand problem. The transatlantic core, North, Euro North America and predominantly the Northern European countries, still think and wish it was the 90s. And they see and evaluate the world from this prism. And this reminds me of what I said at the Brussels Forum a couple of years ago. I said, well, frankly, we only like to listen to what we want to hear. And 20 years from now, we'll still be the same people in the same room talking about the same keywords and same concepts, the tragic thing is the world outside will have changed beyond recognition and sadly will no longer be part of it. And I think this is still continuing. And the third problem, which also stems, I think, from this heads buried in the sand attitude is that we never were, I think, a uniform Western bloc during the Cold War. Sure, during the Cold War, there was also it was also a values-based bloc, but look how many coups took place among, in NATO countries throughout that time. 
So I think we also need to be very realistic, especially in this upcoming NATO summit. Let's not kid ourselves about values. So, and a lot of this is, has got to do with this, as I said, the current ideological uh, struggle. So concluding, I would say, and I think I'm just on time, um, what is the way out of this impasse? I, I think that we need to look at what I would call a Mitrianesque world order. Um, now, Mitrini, at the end of the Second World War, um, sorry, it's in the 1930s, and then Mitrini's ideas were taken up at the end of the Second World War, uh, called this theory called functionalism, which basically means that states get together and cooperate on an issue because they need to, right? But it's not dictated from a top-down policy or through institutions. Regard, uh, slowly through these needs and through these areas of cooperation, they develop other forms of cooperation and gradually this leads to a more institutionalized way of cooperation. So basically, it's little areas of cooperation built on a seamless, endless web uh, transcending borders. And the whole process of functionalism is a bottom-up uh, process. It's not a top-down process. And in this, institutions are functional tools, not the orders of how things ought to be. And this is where, you know, I would totally agree with the other speakers that, you know, when we are looking at where areas where we cooperate, there, there are areas where we can cooperate with other countries, rising powers like China, and with Russia, and how to engage Russia, uh, because there is a need. And it's not just uh, in terms of economics and the way things are changing, such as um, the global patterns, for example, of energy suppliers and uh, consumers are changing. Uh, the international trade routes are changing with uh, Belt and Road. Uh, our whole notion of what constitutes the global commons is changing. So it's not just these changes, but there are also pressing, urgent needs where we need to cooperate, such as the fight against terrorism or climate change. So all of these things require us to do compartmentalized exercises in cooperation where we may not agree on all things together. And gradually, those compartments leading to transnational, seamless webs of cooperation where institutions become a tool. And I think the key to this is to look at where the needs are and to avoid this long-standing ought, oughtness in trying to order things in the world. And I'll end my remarks there. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, it's generally the idea that a panel incorporates a number of people that have widely divergent opinions. In this particular case, the problem is so evident and the direction of the solutions are so clear that uh, the panel has re reflected a rather powerful consensus on what the problems are and how we should proceed. And that in itself, I suppose, is an important achievement. So we have to agree on what the problems are before we can start addressing the problems and devising solutions. So I think rather than ending this panel on a pessimistic note, the agreement may, leads me to say that we should end this panel with an optimistic note. Now the pessimistic news, we're continuing on to the next panel. So thank you very much. Thank you. Kindly now invite the founder of International Cooperation Platform, Cengiz Özgencil, to present a plaque of honor to our keynote speaker, Christian Wolf. Sayın Cumhurbaşkanı, Almanya'da bizi çok iyi ağırladı ve orada bize kesin katılacağını söyledi. Konu başlığını çok önemsediğini söyledi. Kendilerine teşekkür ediyorum. May I kindly invite former Thailand representative for trade, Dr. Nalin Tavisin, 
and chairman of the executive committee of International Cooperation Platform to present a plaque of honor to our distinguished speakers. May I kindly invite Dr. Nalin Tavisin, the former Thailand representative for trade, and Kera Malkin, chairman of the executive committee of International Cooperation Platform. Our distinguished guests are receiving their plaque of honors. Dear guests, we'll be moving on with the panel entitled The Future of Global Trade in Changing World Order. <laughs> 